Hey everyone, and welcome back to Country Music Made Me. Thank you so much for joining us once again. If you haven't already, please be sure to check out our website, countrymusicmademe.com. There you can listen to all of our episodes and also sign up for our newsletter to receive exclusive content like a very special acoustic performance from today's guest, Ryan Griffin. Just head over to countrymusicmademe.com and hit that subscribe button. You can also find us on any streaming platform. So if streaming is your thing, just head over to your favorite, search Country Music Made Me and give us a follow there as well. On today's episode, we are excited to welcome Ryan Griffin. Now his journey in Nashville began back in 2002 while attending Belmont University. Since that time, his journey has been filled with ups and downs and highs and lows, amazing people, amazing music, and amazing shows. Although it hasn't been an easy journey, it's one he wouldn't trade for the world. So please enjoy our conversation with Ryan Griffin. Growing up until like 14 or 15, I was in South Florida. And so I lived in a little, little town called Davie, like right next on the outskirts of Fort Lauderdale. And you know, when my parents went there or grew up there, it was all orange groves and like horses and cows and all that kind of stuff. And then as we got older and the city grew, you know, it turned into basically Fort Lauderdale. Oh, okay. But we had a Keys house too. My grandfather had a Keys house down in um, Isla Mirada. It's one of the first Keys going down. And we would go down there every weekend. Like when we were young, we thought that it was almost uh, – you know, a bear to cross because we're like, oh, we have to go to the Keys again. We can't go hang out with our friends on the weekend and go to the, the new movie that just came out. Right. But now my brothers and I look back on it and we're like, we want to kick our little like six, seven, eight year old butts, you know, and be like, come on, you're in the Keys, you know. But um, so I got to live that life for the first 14 years. And then um, freshman year of high school, my, my parents were like, yo, guess what? We're moving to Ocala. And I said, where, you know? Yeah. And we moved up to Ocala, Florida, which is right. It's like 45 minutes north of Orlando. And I always tell people, if you get up, if you know anything about Florida and you get above Orlando, it basically turns into like rural Georgia. And so that's where everybody's lived for the past, you know, 15 years, 20 years. They've been up there doing their thing. And um, my two older brothers live in Gainesville, which is right there by Ocala. And, okay. You know, they got they got like the family commune happening. They're like compound. <laughs> That's funny. And now, so I saw you talk about a road that uh, you put a picture that your wife and your son were walking up this dirt road. And you were mentioning how a lot of the memories of your past were on that road. Now, is that in Ocala or where that is, is that Ocala? Road? Yeah, that's our 20 acre farm in Ocala. And there were a lot of tears shed that day when I posted that picture because, and my mom and I actually took a drive down that road together, listening to some music. I think my current single that was out and um, it was a really special moment for us. And that it's a quarter of a mile road that goes to the main road that then takes you in the town. Oh, okay. And that's, there's so much that happened on that road from crazy parties, <laughs> you know, to um, me driving down that road when I was probably 15 or 16 and, and hearing you'll think of me keith urban for the first time in that song i'll never forget it man i was running late to high school and i think it was like junior year or something like that and that song came on the radio and i literally put the car in park turned it up and sat there and closed my eyes because i was like this is what i've been waiting for in country music something that kind of blends all of these influences that i've had throughout my life you know from george Strait to brian mcknight and usher it's like that song to me just melodically and everything kind of brought those two worlds together. Right. And now before we get to that point, um, I should sort of set things up on country music made me. I love the journey and going as far back as I can to where this whole musical dream began. And for you, I want to go back to the age of two, I believe. And one as a two year old shushing everyone in the car when Dolly came on. And then also, I think at two, I read that you told your mom at that point that you wanted to be a country singer when you grow up. So are those two things that did happen around the age of two? They are. It's so funny, man. You've done your research. Uh, My mom said like right around two, I was 
you know, I was singing melodies better than I was like talking and putting sentences together, you know? And it was at that time that, you know, I, I was like, I loved singing. And I think it was a little bit later on when I decided I was like, I'm going to be a country singer. Right. Um, but yeah, when Dolly came on, I would shush the entire car. And that's kind of where it all started for me, honestly, like crammed in the back seat of my mom's station wagon in between my two older brothers. And mom was always up front. You know, mama was a DJ. And so she played the songs that she enjoyed and the music she loved. And it was everything from, you know, Colin Ray to Vince Gill. George Strait was is is the king in her eyes and mine. Um, and, you know, Brooks and Dunn. And what I've later found out was that my mom really gravitated towards singers. Like she loved singers, somebody that had like a texture in their voice, like like Ronnie Dunn did or a smoothness to their voice like George did. And, you know, I was so I'm so grateful now looking back on it that my mom had such good taste in, in country music because that was kind of the foundation and the I guess the soundtrack of my childhood. Well, that's the thing. I think I saw you mention that really no one in your family is necessarily musical. So was it that music that you were growing up on that led to this whole journey, really? Oh, yeah. I mean, they they loved country music and nobody in my family had any musical ability. My grandfather actually was the only one. My dad's dad was the only one that could hold a note. And he always sang a song called Tiny Bubbles. And he would sing that to me all the time. And he and I would sing it together. And it was kind of our thing. He was also the one that introduced me at like family dinners. We would have like some big Sunday family dinners at their house. And he would always take me and we would sit in the living room together and he introduced me to the Opry that way. And so it was like a lot of foundational, you know, uh, traits for country music. I learned through him and my mom, you know, and, you know, my my dad always tells the story that, you know, Chad and Danny, my older brothers, they wanted to play, you know, football, baseball. Dad went and got bat ball glove, you know some pigskin and they would throw it, throw it in the backyard and he'd like right. teach him how to play. You know, that was kind of, he did the same thing with me. But when I, when I said I wanted to be a country singer, you know, it was kind of like, Oh, it's real cute for a little while. And then at like 14, 15, I was still wanting to do that. And so my dad was like, I didn't know what to do, you know? And he came home uh, from work early one day, we owned a sod farm just down the road from our house where you grow, we grew St. Augustine grass and I would go there after school every day and work and, uh, you know, drive the tractors and do the whole country thing. And, uh, you know, he came home from work early one day and he flipped through, I think it was the yellow pages or something at the time. And it was just like every studio, every musical, you know, uh, just entity and like store he was calling and he was like yo i got this kid i don't know what to do with him right and nobody he said nobody really talked to him except for this one guy and he happened to be in ocala and he had a a, um i'll never forget his name is wayne and he had a studio in his garage and this was back before like studios were on your iphone you know what i mean right yeah and You know, he had this studio and he was so gracious with us. We were so green. My brother and I were writing songs together. He was kind of the writer and the the, uh, poetic side, I guess. And I would come in and tweak a few things and then put melodies on it. And that's how songwriting started for me. And so we would go into this little garage and uh, we would record our stuff. And we thought it was the coolest thing ever to be able to create something out of nothing and then go to this, this studio in this guy's garage and walk out with a cd of our song completed on it it was like the most magical experience (laughs) and are those still around the cds Uh, yeah they're actually in that's a great question my mom and dad have them in their like uh safety deposit box or something like that because they find them that valuable (laughs) i'm like throw them away (laughs) i've talked to artists in the past who have sort of, they have that past when they were growing up and they have this music they recorded in their bedroom or with some local person. And I always say you should dig it out and listen to it. Maybe you could like sample it on an upcoming track or something. Just take bits and pieces. It'd be cool. That's a great idea. That's a really good idea. <laughs>
you talked about Brian McKnight being one of your influences. Now tell me about listening to any time. I read that that was one that got you through a few tough times in middle school. Yeah, man. You know, it's funny because my brothers and I would always like pull our money together at the end of the week and we'd hop in in his truck, my middle brother's truck, and we'd go over to Peaches, which was a local record store. And we'd always start in country section, see what was out, kind of go over to the rock section. And then I would sneak off over to like the R&B and hip hop section. A lot of my friends at the time in school and like middle middle school, they were into Usher and Casey and JoJo and all this. So I was exposed to it through them. And then I just started like doing a deep dive on my own. And I found the Anytime record by Brian McKnight. And I had a little like three disc boom box player that I thought was everything that I had in my middle school bedroom. Right. And it had a remote control, which was a big deal. <laughs> and I sit on my little trundle bed in my middle school bedroom and I just keep hitting like repeat, repeat, repeat. And I would learn every lick, every in and out, every like nuance of the way Brian sang because I was like, I've never heard anybody sing like this before. And that song changed. It was very much like You'll Think of Me. Um, it just kind of like opened my mind to this other way of singing, this other music, this soulful type of singing. And yeah, that song also got me through my first heartbreak in middle school. <laughs> That's awesome. And so when you're having all these influences come in, you talked about Keith Urban and the moment you heard him and you realized you could put them both together. But before hearing Keith, did you have a mindset on doing music as a career and not really knowing where that was going to lead? Or what was your vision before you realized that you could meld them together and make this into something? Yeah, it was, you know, I was young enough at that point to where um, I felt like I had time to kind of figure it out. I will say up until hearing that Keith Urban song, I didn't feel like I had a place. I didn't know where I fit because if you ask my family, they'd be like, oh, you know, you're too pop for country. And then I'd go talk to my friends and they'd be like, oh, you have that country twang. You're too country to sing pop. Right. And, you know, I'd be singing like anytime, but it'd sound country. And so I kind of was like in this limbo of I don't I don't really know where I fit in. And so when that song came around, it just blended all of these worlds together for me. And I was like, oh, it was like a eureka moment of mom and dad. I, after I, I, uh, I went to school that day and I came back home. And I told my parents, I was like, I'm going to Nashville. And they were like, well, duh. Yeah, we kind of knew you were going to Nashville. And I was like, no, but I'm really going. Like, I, I'm, I'm doing it. And I was the only one to fly the coop. Both of my, my older brothers still live in Florida. have always been within like three hours of the family. And so I went there and they were like, cool. Well, what school are you going to? And I was like, ah, oh, I got to go to school. I got to go to college. Right. And I just wanted to come up to Nashville and start my music career, you know? Yeah. And college ended up being a big blessing. But I went to Belmont University. Crazy story how I got in there because Lord knows I didn't have the grades. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was it was ended up being a really good um, decision for me. So before we get to that crazy story of how you got in, I read that one of your first concerts was Kenny Chesney. Now I've seen on your socials, you've seen him quite a few times over the years. So what did that first concert mean to this journey? And not only the musicality side of this career, but the performance side of the career and being in front of an audience. Yeah, the crazy thing is, is that Chesney was opening, I believe, for Brooks and Dunn at the Chili Cook-Off down in Fort Lauderdale. Oh, okay. And my two older brothers took me, and it was my first concert I'd ever went to. Um, so it was so cool seeing both of those acts. One, because Chesney is just the best performer there is. Two, Ronnie Dunn, like his voice is unbelievable. It's like, you know, it's magnetic for me. When I heard him sing, I was like, that's what I want to do. Right. Um, but Chesney, it's kind of crazy how it all works out because we're part of the same management family. So I've gotten a lot of um, really great advice, not specifically from him, um, but just from his team, which is, you know, thankfully now my team. And they've just taught me so many things along the way that, you know, that he's kind of learned and, you know, how to prepare a set list and how to create a brand and, 
you know, the, all, all the things that he's really, really good at, how to take your live show really serious and, you know, stay in shape for that kind of stuff. And um, I think going and seeing Kenny's show the first time was uh, kind of a, uh, it was like a, it was an experience for me. I won't say it was, it was kind of like a spiritual experience for me, but it was in a way because I watched, I think it was, we we're in Kansas um, at a stadium there, Kansas City. And I think there were 60,000, 50, 60,000 people, something like that in the stands. And I just remember how he, he always kept them right here in the palm of his hand. Yeah. And it was because, and this is what I learned from Kenny, he was not standing on that stage for his, himself. Kenny is not standing on that stage putting on a show for himself. He's standing on that stage putting on a show for the people that are there. And it's all about the people that are there. And a lot of times as artists, we get that confused. We think that people are there to see us. So it's our show. Right. The truth is, is that we're standing on that stage because those people showed up to sing along to our songs. And so it's their show. We're there just to be kind of a vessel for the music. And Kenny taught me that really, really quickly during his show. <laughs> That's awesome. And now let's get to Belmont. What's the story of getting into Belmont? Well, everybody knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. And right. my aunt happened to work in radio at the time. And she was like doing everything she could to try to help me kind of get, get my foot in the door in Nashville. Oh, okay. And she ended up calling a guy named, named Mark Wright. She had a friend of a friend that knew Mark Wright. Well, Mark Wright, uh, was a massive producer back in the day. He was also uh, vice president of MCA at the time. Oh, okay. So I get this phone call that says, hey, you need to call, yada, 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 set up an appointment. You have, you know, the opportunity to go meet with Mark Wright. And my parents, being the incredible parents that they are, were like, everybody load up in the station wagon. We're going to Nashville. So we all hop in the station wagon. We go to Nashville. And... You know, I didn't realize at the time what how much of a sacrifice it was. You know, it cost money to get up here. Dad had to take off work. Kids had to come. Brothers had to not go to school. And but they were chasing this opportunity and this dream with me. And so we came up. I'm sitting in the lobby, and the receptionist comes out and goes, "Ooh, I'm sorry, Mr. Griffin. Um, talking to my dad, oh, okay. uh, but there's uh, there's really no time in his schedule today. Do you guys think you can come back on Monday? This was a Friday. Oh, wow. And dad's like, we're already paying for hotels. Like we don't, I have to go back to work, all this kind of stuff. So we're kind of freaking out and we're like, Oh gosh, what do we do? And then Mark walks out and he goes, I got 15 minutes. I can give you 15 minutes. So we <laughs> sit down in his office. He listens to this, this little recording that we had. And he goes, you know what? He's like, I'm going to tell you the truth. He goes, you're really green, really young. Um, basically, you know, just need to get a little experience under your belt, but you have a really cool tone in your voice. And that's what I'm always looking for. So he said, I, I typically wouldn't encourage people to do this, but I'm going to write you a letter to Belmont because he was on the board. Oh, and he's okay. like, I'm going to write you a letter and, you know, give it to the board and, and uh, try to maybe that'll help get you accepted. So I go to Belmont and this, a year passes. I end up calling him. He's true to his word. He writes the letter. I go to Belmont. I perform for the music school. I get into the music school. You know, you had to sing classical and operatic and all this kind of oh, stuff. Oh, really? I, that was, that's not me, dude. <laughs> but somehow I squeaked my way in. I get into Belmont and within two weeks, I call my mom and I'm like, mom, I hate this. I, uh, <laughs> they're telling me how to like hold my mouth and make all these noises. And I was like, this seems like the biggest waste of time. And I don't really want them like changing what I think is special about my voice. Right. And so I said, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, I'm going to transfer into the music business program. My mom's like, all right, whatever, you, whatever you think, I guess it's only been two weeks. I was like, I'm doing it. <laughs> so thankfully you can transfer within Belmont. If you've, if you, once you've gotten in. Oh, okay. So I ended up going to the music business program, writing out my four years there and getting a music business degree. But I would have never been able to go get in the music business program if I had not gone through the music program first and got that recommendation from. <laughs> oh, man, things lead to things, right? 
It's so funny. Everybody knows somebody. And so, I don't know. I don't know how things work, but that was a funny one for me. That's crazy. And another interesting story while you were at Belmont is you're interning at Broken Bow Records. Yep. And you're all of a sudden asked to be the tour manager for Jason Aldean. Now, tell me about this story. I, I, I couldn't find the story anywhere. Everyone mentions that you did this, but there's no background to it. So where was Aldean at that point in his career? And was this just basically as experience for the business part of your schooling? Yeah, so I ended up, there was a new label and it was Broken Bow Records at the time. And I remember getting the internship there and Tina Crawford, who's like my sister now, she was head of A&R, a and assistant or something like that. And so I was kind of under her thumb. And so I'd go through like CDs and I'd, I'd take home boxes of CDs and listen to stuff and, you know, always took it very seriously because I was like, there could be a gold nugget in here somewhere. Right. There never was. There was a song called Buckle Rubbin' one time that <laughs> came with perfume and cologne scents and it was it smelled like I don't know it did not smell the best Um, (laughs) and anyway so I'm sitting there in the mail room at one point during the day and I'm like sending out Jason's first single Hicktown okay and Jason we called him Peach back in the day and he walked in and he was like Griff and he we would always just talk when he was walking in and out or whatever you know because okay he, he really wasn't a big deal at the time and He's also a super nice guy. So we were just sitting there and we talk and, and chat. And, and he came in one day and he was like, Griff, I need you out on the road. I'm going to play the biggest show of my life. And and uh, I was like, do you have a bus? And he goes, yeah, yeah, we got a bus. I need you. And so I was like, heck yeah, let's do it. And it was at Billy Bob's in Texas, oh, in nice. Dallas, Texas. And so we hopped on the bus and I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. I think the the AC broke down within like the first, you know, hour, being, you know, it was just, we were, everybody was scraping together whatever they could at that point to make it work. And, and I went out on the road with them that weekend and, and I didn't get off the road for about eight months. I stayed out there with them and oh, I just wow. ended up kind of becoming his tour manager. And it was really, you know, there was never like an official title of like, all right, Griffin's now the tour manager, which they called me crest out on the road, crest, I don't know why. I think it's because they thought I looked like Brian Seacrest when I walked in. Oh, really? Um, but uh, I went out on the road with them and stayed out there for eight months. And it was the best experience I ever had because I learned so much about the real life, like being on the road, like how hard it is, the sacrifices people go through, taking care of the band, taking care of catering, taking care of merch, taking care of the bus driver and all the hotel rooms and all that kind of stuff just kind of started falling onto me. And it was the best experience of my life. I have so much respect for everybody out on the road and, and tour managers, especially like I'll never take for granted a tour manager. They're special people. (laughs) And so after school with that experience and with a business degree, was there ever a thought in your mind to move into that part of the industry or was it always a focus of I'm just going to finish this and that's just to get to where I want to be as an artist no not for me man I um, I remember when I told Peach I was leaving I was like man you know they, I used to always do sound checks for him and I'd get up there and sing and I'd do Y and Amarillo Sky were my two favorites and they always said man you sing like a bird you know and and uh so they kind of knew that's what that opened up the dialogue of like, well, this is what I really want to do. And so when I said, I'm, I'm piecing out, I got to go back, finish my degree and, and chase this dream. They all got it. They all understood, you know, but I never and still to this day, even with, which I'm sure we'll talk about, you know, like the roller coaster of Nashville as an artist and yep. losing two record deals and, all of that kind of stuff. It's like, I've never thought about going to the other side of the industry because that's just not what I was created to do. <laughs> well, that's what one of the things I was going to ask you as a musician and this roller coaster ride that this career is, at the end of the day, how do you do it? Like when you are going to tell other musicians who are just getting into it, like I've talked to other musicians who say, if you would have told me, when I was 10 years old, that this is what it was going to take, I would have ran the other way. Like, so when you actually do it and you're in it, how, 
How do you do it mentally, physically, just pushing through every single day? Well, that's a really good question. It's a really hard question to answer because the truth is, I don't know. The, I can kind of piece together what I've done and give you the answer. Um, the biggest thing I think is you have to be 100% committed. There's no plan B. There's no exit strategy. There's no, oh, it's getting hard. Uh, you know, I guess this isn't where I'm called. Any of that kind of stuff. It's like you have to get that out of your mind and go, I'm going to do this and nothing's going to stop me from doing it. I think one, if I'm being really honest with you, which I feel like this is a pretty vulnerable, honest podcast. Absolutely. <laughs> Just from talking with you, I will say that I've always kind of felt this calling to do this. I've always from a very young age felt like um, this is a, a, a part of my purpose uh, in life is to continue to share music and write music and um, and connect with people in that way. And so there there were multiple times along the journey where I was like, I was checking in with that and going like, okay, is this still where I'm called to be? Is this still where I think I'm supposed to be? And every single time the answer always came back with an overwhelming like bear hug of a yes, stay the course. This last time when, which is, you know, a year ago, I guess it was last February when I got the phone call from the second label and they were like, yo, sorry, COVID last in first out. Yeah. That was the hardest one for me because we were prepared to launch. It was, it was I was supposed to be like the, the focus artists of 2021 for Warner Nashville. And it was, it was a big deal. All the, all the stars were aligning. It felt like, and then everything just got shattered as yeah. it did for many people, you know, during COVID and so that was a hard one to like pick myself up from and go, okay, am I just, am I just chasing a carrot here? Like, am I never going to get it? Is it that kind of thing? And I'll give my wife all the credit because she's been on this journey with me for 15 years and we've been married for 10 of those years. And she told me, she's like, no, you're not done. We're still doing this together. This is still what you're called to do. And my biggest concern was like, I was failing her. I was failing my two children, you know, because as a, as the husband and the father of the home, I kind of feel like, and my wife's a stay at home mom, which is a huge blessing, but I felt like, you know, I needed to provide oh, and yeah. I wasn't necessarily giving much security to, to my family at that point. So it was really hard for me if she hadn't given me the permission to keep going it would have been really hard for me to continue to keep pushing forward just because of all the responsibilities, you know, that I have yeah. um, other than music, but God bless my wife and her belief because she sat me down and basically said, uh, uh, we're not done. You need to take all these songs that you've written for the past 10 years. You need to start putting them up on social media, getting rid of the gatekeepers, just sharing them with people and connecting directly. And I wouldn't be here if she hadn't said that, you know, so there's, there's a lot of ups and downs and crazy twists and turns. And I think to answer your question, the best thing to do is to walk into it eyes wide open, knowing that it's going to probably be the hardest thing you've ever done. Um, but you cannot have an escape route or an exit plan or a plan B you got to be all in and it's, it's never going to be the way you think it's going to be, you know? Yeah. And it's exactly. always going to be twists and turns that you don't see coming. And within this journey, I know it's always hard to look back as an artist because the focus is always what's ahead, what's next. But I saw in early 2017, when you were getting ready to release your debut EP, you were driving around in your truck, listening to the final mixes of the song, and you found your way through Belmont and driving around the campus and just going on sort of that full circle journey. And so how important are those full circle moments within this journey to let you know, oh yeah, I used to be here and now I'm here. I am doing something. I am moving in a positive direction. That's a really good point. Um, a lot of times I feel like we can get lost in this little bubble that Nashville's created. 
um, where it's the comparison game. You're constantly comparing yourself to, oh, well, I went to college with that person and they have two number ones and I only have one number one. Right. And I went to college with that person and, you know, they're a big successful executive or they're this or they're that. And, oh, I was best friends with this person before they ever blew up. I can tell you 15 of those stories, you know? Right, yeah. You, you sit there and you're like, oh, when's it going to be my turn? And driving through Belmont in those full circle moments to me are like God winks of going like, hey, keep going. You're on the right path. It's like a little check in, you know, kind of reassuring that you're where you're supposed to be. One of the biggest lessons that I've learned in this crazy journey of, you know, the music industry, I'm sure everybody can relate to this and no matter what industry you're in, is that the comparison game is the most unhealthy thing you can possibly do. We all have our own path. We all have our own journey that's carved for us. And when you sit there and try to compare your life to their life, it's never going to be a, a, an even playing field. It's never going to be an equal, you know, comparison. And the funny thing is, is that that person's probably doing the same thing with you because that's what we do as human beings. And when I figured that out, you know, it's common sense when you sit here and you talk about it, it's like something, it's like a cliche almost at this point. But when you really think about it and you really start to practice that it can change a lot of, a lot of things in your life. Yeah. I saw a great quote one time. It, it just mentioned how it's hard to ever be happy because the thing you're reaching for when you have it, that's your life now. So it's just part of your everyday. So you don't realize necessarily you have it. So even these superstars who are playing the biggest stadiums and, and doing what artists like you want to do, they're not necessarily sitting there enjoying it because they're also looking at what's next. They're not necessarily saying, oh, I wanted to play stadiums when I was 10 and now I'm doing it. They're like, what's next? What's next? So at any stage of this life, it's very difficult to appreciate what you have, no matter what, right? A hundred percent. And it's so interesting though. It's this like dichotomy and this, this, uh, this balance that you have to find of when is it ever enough? Yeah, exactly. Like, because you do have to stay motivated. You do have to, you know, continue to push forward, uh, all of those things. But at the same time, it's like, okay, you have to balance that with like gratitude and, and, uh, you know, drawing, drawing that line in the sand of like, okay, this is enough. I'm going to, I'm going to be content here. And if I get more awesome, if I don't, I'm just going to be thankful for what I have. And that is a, that's a lesson that I think you can only learn. You have to walk through it. I think people can tell you to your blue in the face or to the, their blue in the face, but you have to experience it and walk through it to really understand it. Yeah. And one of those moments I saw for you was playing Red Rocks. And there's the little tunnel that I never knew about this tunnel until I saw it on your social media. And everyone signs the wall in this rock tunnel leading to the stage. And I saw you mention that at the time it was maybe lost on you that it, you know, you're just going through the moment that you don't take time to enjoy it until after the fact. And so talk about that experience of Red Rocks, because that is certainly one of my bucket list places to go to. Red Rocks was a really cool opportunity for us. We have been blessed to kind of come up with the old Dominion crew and those boys are like brothers to me. And so when they played Red Rocks, we got the privilege of opening for them. And it was definitely a bucket list show for me and experience for me, but I had no idea what I was walking into. You know, I mean, you can see the pictures, you can see videos and all that kind of stuff, but it's the only venue I've ever played where you are humbled at the base of the audience. So you're standing at the bottom and everybody, even the front row is above you. Right. And it just keeps going up. So typically we're standing above everybody kind of singing down towards them. This way we're singing up to everybody. It's a very intimidating feeling having a couple thousand people soaring over the top of you. And it's also a really um, a, a emotional experience because, and you kind of have to experience it to understand it, but when people cheer and clap, it almost falls on you like rain 
because right. they're above you. Yeah. And it's the, tri- it's the trippiest, like craziest sensation. And it's, it's so weird because you can feel every clap, every woohoo, every whatever you like feel it falling on you. And it's a really, really cool experience. And to be able to play Red Rocks really so early in my career, if you will, um, was a was a pretty magical experience. That's amazing. And another magical experience, of course, the Opry. Now, this stage, I saw, I think it was around 2017, I had it in my notes that you were at a music festival. I can't remember what music festival it was. And they had a pop-up stage for the Opry. Oh, Tortuga. And just, yeah. Tortuga, yeah. And just a little makeshift Opry stage that you could stand in. And I was wondering at that point, do you remember that point and mentally in your career where you were at? And as you were standing there, was the Opry a reality in your mind at that point? Was it, yes, I'm going to do this one day? Or was that a moment that you were like, this is cool, but I doubt this is ever going to happen for me? Being completely honest, uh, no, I didn't think it was ever going to happen because what had happened where I was, when I was standing on that little makeshift stage in Tortuga, what was actually going on in my life was I had been dropped from my previous record deal on Sony. Okay. They basically had like a change of guard, if you will. The CEO left, a new CEO came in and cleared house. Basically anybody who wasn't a baby act or all the baby acts got got uh, let go. Okay. And I was actually still on the label and all the baby acts were gone. And my manager went in there, Clint Hyam, and he talked to Randy Goodman, who's now the, the CEO of Sony. And he said, what are you doing with my artist, Ryan? And he said, nothing. I'm just holding on to him out of respect for you because Kenny was over there at the time and old dominion and Clint manages both of them. So it was kind of like a, a respect play and oh, okay and Clint goes, no 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 let him go if you don't believe in what he's doing if he's not if he's not under your you know umbrella if you will let him go and so the next day I was dropped from from uh Sony and it, what's crazy is like all of these situations there's nothing I could have done you know yeah. what I mean the changing of the guard COVID happening all this kind of stuff there was really nothing I could have done it was just uh bad timing in a way and so standing on that stage, that little pop-up Opry stage, at that time felt like that was the closest I was ever going to get to being in that circle. Right. And, you know, I was an independent artist, didn't really have a ton going on. I was just, I had my head down at the time and I was writing a lot and I was trying to like find that song, find that, that sound, that voice. And so it meant a lot to me, honestly, standing on that little pop-up stage. Cause I was like, Hey, if this is as far as I go, at least I can say I played the Opry, <laughs> but it ended up being, uh, just a, uh, it ended up being the, the pre-stage, I guess, <laughs> for me, because a little while back, a couple months back, I got to finally make my Opry debut. And it's one of those things that I always wanted to do. And I always like, if you work hard enough, maybe you could get there. But the Opry, I, I hold in such high esteem and I always have, always will. Uh, you know, not just anybody gets to play that stage. So in a way, I don't know if I'll ever feel worthy of standing in that circle and playing that stage. So there was that in my head too of like, well, if you don't ever get to play the Opry, that's okay. You know, it's, you gotta be pretty, pretty worthy to be able to play that stage. And so when I got to stand on that circle and play the Opry for the first time, it was, it meant that much more to me. It was like, holy crap, we did it. Like we're standing in the circle. And right before my grandfather passed, he told me, he's like, just keep pushing. You know, you'll be standing in that circle one day. And so flood of emotions went through my mind when I was standing up there for my 10 minutes, you know, playing my couple songs. And uh, it was pretty amazing. The entire Opry house sang Salt, Lime and Tequila back to me and blew the roof off the place. Like it was mind blowing. <laughs> well, how like 
how much of a mind trip is it that you're playing the Opry, but this is as an independent artist. This is a couple of months after you've been dropped by your label, I believe. So within this whole journey and chasing the record deals and this and that, and what you think you need to chase to be an artist, and then to get this opportunity and to find this success finally as an independent artist, like how does that mess with your mind a bit? Uh, I realized really quick that I didn't want to be on a major label again. You know, I'd kind of been burned twice. I also kind of got to the top and saw how it all works and functions. And, and it just, it wasn't something that I necessarily, um, and that necessarily instilled a lot of trust in me. Right. Yeah. So when I was independent, you know, the biggest thing for me was how do I continue to move forward and without a major label and so i was praying real hard about like just the the solution to that and that's when jay demarcus called me which was just after thanksgiving you know a couple months back and was like hey man let's sit down and grab some coffee together and so we first off it's jay demarcus rascal flats i'm like yeah. berlin inside like a like a madman and trying to keep my composure. And he asked me to be the flagship artist of his new label during that meeting. And my jaw kind of hit the floor because I was like, this is exactly what I've been praying for. This is exactly what I've been focused on and trying to, um, like trying to see, but I couldn't quite see it because it hadn't existed yet. (laughs) Um, And so, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's been a heck of a journey, dude. And um, I'm really, really thankful that I'm, I kind of landed where I did. And to also have a, a label head that's done it all. Like he's given me the best advice. Best advice he's given me, honestly, is less about music and more about how to balance family life being out on the road. You know, we've been out 14 weeks uh, pretty much straight on radio tour. And maybe we're home for 36 hours a week. Maybe oh, wow. most of the time I'm in town working if I'm home. So I get to like kiss my kids and hang out with them for a couple hours and go back out on the road for another week. And so it's been, it's been a heck of a journey, but he's definitely helped me kind of find that balance. And it's, you know, it's a daily, daily uh, effort I've put into that. Yeah. And so along this journey, you had your debut EP in 2017 and then your major label debut EP in 2020 and now in 2022 you have your next EP which is label supported it's not major label but a label supported EP so along this journey with every release does it almost feel like it's a new start like this is the start of your journey in a lot of ways it it does it's like okay and we begin. Let's go. You know, a lot of ways it feels like that, but I know myself so much better as an artist now. I can walk into these radio, you know, stations doing radio tour, way more confident in who I am and answer the questions. Like throw any question you got. And, you know, I've been doing this long enough to where I know myself well enough to where I can give you somewhat of an answer, you know, and and that to me just comes with time and experience. Everybody, everybody finds that at different points along the way, you know, Kelsey found it at like 21, honestly, 22. Yeah. He was kind of an old soul and kind of found it quick. Um, and it's always, it's an evolving journey, you know what I mean? But she kind of captured it really quick. Um, and I've always just been a late bloomer to be honest. So it's, it's one of those things where I think everybody's on their own journey and, uh, the biggest blessing looking back on it is that, you know, I really do feel like I know who I am as a, as a human being, but also as a, as an artist. Right. And now slow down sunrise is the new EP. And you've talked about sort of taking all your music from the past 10 or so years and and starting to take a look at it and put it out. And you've uh, been putting a lot of demos out on social media as well. So with this EP, are you taking time to enjoy it or is it already moving on to the next phase of music that we'll get to see from you? Man, you asked the good questions. Um, it's funny cause we go on different cycles. Like I've been enjoying it for the past eight months of creating it. Right. Uh, 
And then we kind of create it, package it up, give it to the world. And now it's their turn to kind of share it and love it and create and enjoy it. So now I'm on this journey of what's next, just like every artist always is. And, you know, I'm really proud of the music we put out. And, you know, I hope it really takes people to a place like just a happy place, a place where they can kind of decompress from all the craziness in life. And we kind of created an escape for 30 minutes. Now, the next part of the record, I've been thinking about it a lot. And I just I wanted to still have that same same intention, but to show you a couple more layers, go a little deeper, you know, um, and just give a little bit more more context. So right. that's that's the plan moving forward. And I've already got half of the EP in my head, you know, of what, what I want. And now I just need to kind of fill in around the blanks. And so when you look back at your teenage self, who's taking classic country and Brian McKnight and thinking, what do I do with these two? And then hearing Keith Urban and now to where you are today, when you look back on that teenage boy, are you proud of how you've been able to take those genres and make it your own within this career? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, it's been such a crazy journey. I've seen Nashville go from super country to like two pop to back to country again, holding on to a few of the hip hop and like pop elements. And it's been a really interesting uh, experience because I've experienced it from the writer's room in Nashville, primarily. Right. So seeing how country music has evolved over the past decade has been really interesting. And, you know, one of the major, I guess, like cornerstones in my career was after I lost my first deal on Sony, I kind of, there's kind of a rule in Nashville. It's like, eh, after you lose a, a deal, nobody's going to touch you like a 10 foot pole. You know, you're like, you're, you're tainted goods, if you will. Oh, okay. And, you know, it's funny because I was talking to Walker the other day, we were playing a show together, Walker Hayes. And, and uh, he said, and this was before I got my third record deal. He goes, hell man. Well, you know, he's like, I think I'm on my fourth now. And so he's like, you know, who cares? Nobody, nobody cares about how many record deals you have. It's just, you know, keep, keep pushing forward and keep going. I love that man so much. Um, we've shared a lot of the same journey, but, you know, after I lost that, that deal on Sony, I, I wasn't really sure what was going to happen. And this was another one of those like God winks. There's a guy named Mike Busby who right. huge producer. to ask about him. Yeah. Yeah. Huge producer, incredible songwriter wrote, you know, a bunch of pop songs and then kind of came in the country. He was one of the only guys that could kind of, have one foot in country and one foot in pop and be really successful in both. And, uh, you know, he found Marin Morris and Carly Pierce and, and he was looking for a male act. And so he ended up through a buddy of mine, Daniel Lee, he ended up, uh, we ended up connecting and we geeked out over Brian McKnight over any time. That was one of his favorite songs too. And, he is the reason that I ended up getting another another chance and getting a deal on Warner Brothers. And we were creating this music. You were you were asking about, you know, country and pop and all this. And, and would my 14 year old self be proud of me? And, you know, that was our intent. Our intent was to take this soulful side of like Brian McKnight and R&B and then to merge it into country, but to do it in a way that was like really honest and a way that was um, uh, a little bit different than, than what's currently out there. And so we were working really hard on that record and we had gotten like three songs cut and we were gonna put out an EP. And then he ended up being diagnosed with uh, a brain tumor. And we lost him really quick. We lost him within a couple months. And it kind of shook the bedrock, like the foundation of so many people because, uh, you know, he was just, he was kind of like our, he was our guy. He was the guy that like everybody that was around him, he had kind of plucked and brought into this circle. And he just like believed in us, you know, and made us believe in ourselves. And, um, you know, Carly was a part of this and, it was, he was one of the biggest blessings to ever come across, you know, come in, come in and out of my life. Um, 
but that was, so if I was looking back, my 14 year old self would be incredibly proud of the music that we've created. And it's been this crazy journey of, um, you know, exploring and different sounds, different producers, different people that have inspired, you know, inspired the music and Busby was a huge, huge part of that. So I'm really thankful for, for him and for all the people that kind of came in and just uh, made an, an imprint in my, uh, during my journey along, along the way. And losing deals, um, you know, the disappointments of the career, does any of it compare to losing him? No, no, that was definitely the biggest thing I faced because at the end of the day, you know, it's like you lose a deal. It's like losing a, losing a contract, no matter what, what business you're in, you know, it's business, you know? Yeah. Um, losing one of your best friends and mentors. That's something that you kind of never get over. You just, you, I'll always hold a piece of him, you know, hold a piece of him close. And there will be weeks where every single day I think about him and some days it's happy. Some days it's sad. Um, but he's definitely impacted my life in a way that nobody else has. So that was the hardest thing. You know, it's funny because in this career, you don't get time to really soak things in. You have to be intentional about that. Like you were saying, like, did you even soak, soak in red rocks? It's like, I tried really hard when I was in that tunnel. I had my little boy with me and, you know, we signed the wall together. And so it was like, I'll never forget that. That was a moment that I kind of carved out intentionally so that I could soak it in. Um, But I think, um, I think it's really hard really hard to do that from time to time though you have to carve out the time and and buzz was uh yeah he was just a huge part the the thing that was was rough about losing buzz is that i never had time to stop and mourn him even when i was sitting at his funeral you know it was like i had to do a video shoot the next day last time i saw buzz i was actually in la cutting the music video for right here right now and I woke up in the morning, drove to his house, saw him for an hour, then had to drive to the music video shoot. You know, it's like so I never really had time to, to mourn him. Right. And it was it wasn't until like six months later that I was sitting in therapy over at Porter's Call, which is like the most amazing um, nonprofit mental health organization. It's all for musicians in Nashville. and. Uh, I was sitting over there and I was just talking through life and things, you know, trying to keep that balance. And I just broke down and it was because it was the first moment that I had to actually mourn him. You know what I mean? It was the first time that life slowed down um, enough to where I could mourn him. And it was, uh, yeah, he he was a super impactful human in my life (laughs) in so many ways. Thank you once again so much for listening. And thank you to Ryan for stopping by and sharing his story. Be sure to check out his new EP, Slow Down Sunrise, wherever you stream your music. Please also be sure to check out our website, countrymusicmademe.com. There you can listen to all of our episodes and also sign up for our newsletter to receive exclusive content, including a very special acoustic performance of Ryan's new single, Salt, Lime, and Tequila. Just head over to countrymusicmademe.com and hit that subscribe button. You can also find us on any streaming platform. So if streaming is your thing, just head over to your favorite, search Country Music Made Me and give us a follow there as well. Thanks once again so much for listening and we'll see you next time on Country Music Made Me. Music